Thank you very much. I appreciate that stand between you. Actually, we will have a, we will have a panel discussion as well. Maxine is going to take all the questions on quantum computing, by the way. That's not for me. But first, let me say a little bit about bioelectronic medicines. Um, you can never guess what my bold statement is going to be at the end of this talk, given the questions we have above us, right? Uh, so when the immune system turns against you, can bioelectronic medicines come to rescue? I want to start by talking a little bit about health. Uh, one way we at Galvani often think about health is that it is a, a complex set of biological balances that are going on at any one time in our body. So as we sit here today, we have a, a balance between contraction and um, uh, relaxation in our blood vessels and our airways. We have in our metabolism a, a balance between storing energy and burning energy. Our immune system, which we talked about before, it has a balance between attacking and being tolerant to, to cells around it, and so on and so forth. Really, there's a, a, a plethora of balances that are going on for any one of us to be healthy. And consequently, in, in chronic disease, uh, it's often that one of those balances are a bit knocked out of whack. Now, even with the high attrition rate of molecular drug discovery that we discussed earlier today, uh, drug discovery, finding molecular medicines has also been very successful over the last century and a half. Uh, and that is because we figured out back in the early 19th century that we can sort of plug in to these control mechanisms that biology have in place. So you have a lot of signaling between different uh, cells and within cells between molecules that control the balances in our body. And the organic chemists figured out long before I was born that when you, if you sort of piggyback on that and uh, design small molecules, you can, you can tap into that control system. Uh, and you see an example of a ligand here sitting in a, a, a molecule to your left. Now, Two, three decades ago, uh, the drug discovery community took on the, the bigger type of molecules here, a, a antibody, and turned that into a potent disease fighter, if you will, where you, you use the specificity of antibodies to address imbalances in certain diseases. And molecular medicine, therefore, has become the mainstay of, of therapeutic control in biology. Now, here's the thing, and here's the thing that, that, that good old Luigi Galvani discovered that 230 years ago. Biology itself is not only using molecular control. Biology is also using electrical control to fine-tune our biology. That's why when, when Luigi did that uh, audacious experiment with the frog legs, you actually got a muscle contraction when electricity was applied to the nerves. And in the centuries that has since gone by, there's been careful mapping of where these nerves go in our body. And in our main body cavities, where we have all these organs that are involved in many chronic diseases, there are small peripheral nerves, autonomic nerves they are called, that, that crisscross those body cavities and connect to virtually every organ. And, and you see them depicted here in the middle. You have sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves that go out to these organs. And, organs. and they, are, they are there for control purposes. So biology uses electricity for control. Now, we haven't really used that in the therapeutic community to make therapies extensively until now. So uh, a few years ago, there were a number of fields that started to come together and say, look, we need to be much more serious about building precision uh, implants that connect to these peripheral autonomic nerves and seek to use that axis of control for therapeutic effect. Um, now, that all sounds good like a concept. Uh, we, turning that into a, a concrete reality and a concrete understanding is harder. Learned that a bit the hard way in uh, when we published a manifesto back five, six years ago to, to launch this field of bioelectronic medicines or electroceuticals, we described these tiny implants with precision neuromodulation, and we're very chuffed that we got it into nature as a commentary, only then to open nature and see this uh, picture on the, 
article with a car battery connected to a washer in the brain. Not quite the sort of bioelectronic medicines we were envis envisioning. Uh, on the contrary, it is uh, what you should actually take as a starting point when you think about what these devices will look like one day. Think about the pacemaker. Uh, you see a, an x-ray of a, a pacemaker here. Uh, that is an active implantable medical device. They've existed for decades. Uh, you pack in the electronics in a little hermetic package and you connect with a little cable to the, the biology that you're interested in. Those are the sort of principles we're taking to the next level in bioelectronic medicines now with small implantable devices, can be applied through keyhole surgery, connect into particular nerves like the ones that are here in the middle. So I hope that gives you a feel for what the, the hardware will look like. I want to talk about what matters most as a starting point, though, and that is what is the sort of potential therapeutic effect we can have through modulating the neural signals in these nerves. I'm delighted that this morning there's been a fair bit of discussion about the immune system already. Uh, and I want to use autoimmune diseases as an example of what uh, bioelectronic medicines may be able to, to do. And why is that? Well, autoimmunity is such a um, classic example of, of these sort of balances going awry. We, we have the immune system. We have all those 10 to 12 cells that uh, someone mentioned this morning that is whizzing around our biology and is there to... Uh, defend us against microbes. If I hadn't been there, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today, right? But then in disease, some of that exquisite protection turns against us and start attacking our own tissue. Rheumatoid arthritis is a classic example of an autoimmune disease where our immune cells attack the, the joints and you get inflammation and you get structural change uh, so in the picture of the patient, you see here the hands have been deformed over time. It's painful, it's debilitating, it's affecting millions of patients around the world. Some of those molecular drugs that I talked about before have had a, a significant impact here over the last couple of decades, where uh, you know, state-of-art therapies can help to rein in the immune system a bit, uh, but it's far from... Uh, sufficient to really get patients in, in large number into remission. So still today, and I think Ken mentioned it this morning, a, a significant share of patients are not responding to these therapies. And, and patients that have benefit typically still have residual active disease. So we, we need additional therapies to really uh, shift the balance of the immune system back to a non-self-attacking state. Now, you may wonder, how, how, do the, how in the world do the nerves then that I was talking about before connect in with billions of cells that are circulating around? Well, the beautiful thing is that there are a couple of organs, organs like the spleen and the lymph nodes, where these immune cells are coming through and are being programmed and reprogrammed in essence. And in rheumatoid arthritis, there's actually some early clinical data that, that gives us reason to believe that such reprogramming can help uh, shift disease towards a less inflammatory, more uh, controlled state. So there's a, um, a pioneering company out in California called Setpoint Medical, Galvani has no association with them, uh, that have taken an, an early sort of indirect uh, approach to affecting the splenic control of immune cells. They have developed a, a bioelectronic medicine that stimulates up uh, here in the neck region on the, the vagus trunk, so a big nerve trunk that goes out and innervates most parts of our main body cavities. Um, and by stimulating there, they believe that they can in turn evoke some uh, neural signals all the way down to the spleen here via a little junction box called the, the celiac ganglion. And when putting such implants in rheumatoid arthritis patient, they showed a few years ago that you can shift the disease activity downwards. So without going into too much into detail, you can look up the publication here. You have stimulation going on here. You get a suppression of your disease state as well as markers of that disease. They switched off a treatment. The disease resurged a bit. 
they switched back on the treatment and they got a reduction of these disease scores. So there's something here if you can evoke the neural control of the spleen. Now, it's easier surgically and device de design-wise to go to this cervical, this neck region that this company did. But the real action may well be closer to the end organ, right? This is where you can have a, a, a true precision in modulating the electrical signals that control that organ. And just last month, some of the preclinical work here in a uh, mouse model of rheumatoid arthritis called collagen-induced arthritis model have started to come out. And, and this is a, a, a severe animal model. These, these uh, mice get these sort of disease damages in most of their joints very swiftly. You see the blue curve here is a measure of a, a, that, the, the score of rheumatoid arthritis in these mice. When you stimulate the splenic nerve in these mice, you get a, a significant uh, suppression and delay of that disease onset in, in mice. So what I hope I, I've been able to show you here in, in rheumatoid arthritis examples is that there's actually a, uh, a, a link between neural control and splenic programming of immune cells that can get all the way through to affecting the outcome potentially in disease. I want to give you one more example, and that is in uh, type 1 diabetes. So uh, as I'm sure many of you know, in type 1, type one the, our uh, immune system is attacking the beta cells in the pancreas, uh, destroying those cells. They are the cells that produce insulin, and patients are left to inject insulin for the rest of their lives. That is not only a significant burden on patients, it also typically comes with a, a number of complications over the decades as uh, the type 1 diabetics seek to manage their disease. There is no available treatment today to uh, suppress that attack on the beta cells. Some work that is publishing right now uh, is uh, potentially turning that on its head. Uh, this is some beautiful work done by a uh, lab in France, outside Nice, led by Professor Philippe Blancou, and it's just about to, to publish in Nature Biotechnology. Uh, I'll try to describe this messy graph because it's really quite, quite exciting. What they have done is they have applied neural stimulation to the nerve that innervates the lymph nodes around the pancreas. And in the lymph nodes, our immune cells go and they get activated uh, to attack certain antigens, these sort of markers that, that our immune cells recognize that are associated with the beta cells and then they go into the pancreas and destroy these beta cells. So you want to stop that activation of these cells. What this paper, this work shows is just that. Here you have uh, mice that have that naturally get uh, type 1 diabetes, a certain strain of mice called nod mice that get type 1 diabetes. You uh, identify the mice when they start getting diabetes because their blood glucose goes up. You implant these mice, and in one group, you, you just have these implanted electrodes on the pancreatic nerve and no stimulation. And what happens with these mice Actually, after a bit of a reduction in the diabetes for a day or two after surgery, which is seen across the board, you see the blue lines here. These mice get rampant type 1 diabetes. Uh, blood glucose levels go up through the roof, lots of complications. The mice that were stimulated on the pancreatic nerve here uh, did not have a return to disease. They had perfectly normal baseline glucose levels, 6 out of 6 mice. These are the red lines. And then the black and the green lines are just uh, solid controls that any good scientific experiment should have. Basically, they try to stimulate the nerve, but also blocking the neural signals, and they show that, that then you don't have a protective effect. So it's really down to both stimulating the nerves and evoking neural signals. And this is exactly the sort of precision treatment effects that uh, we at Galvani believe one day we may be able to bring to treatment of chronic disease. So let me wrap up by just explaining what this can look like uh, five, ten years from now. 
you'll be coming to, if you're a patient, to your specialist, uh, and instead of prescribing a molecular intervention or maybe a cellular intervention that, that we heard before, bioelectronic medicine uh, may be there as a treatment option. You will be sent to a surgeon, an abdominal surgeon, say in, in the type 1 diabetes case, who would be implanting this tiny device through laparoscopic surgery. You'd come back to your specialist, your endocrinologist, say here in this picture, a couple of weeks later, he or she will program the device on a tablet, set the right stimulation parameters for you, and that would initiate your treatment. You will have an app, by the way, on your own smartphone where you can see your charging levels and whether your treatment is on and so on. That is the potential that we have before us with bioelectronic medicines. So to wrap up, uh, could one day when our immune system turn against us, bioelectronic medicines come to, to rescue? Uh, yes, subject to uh, a lot of clinical testing for safety and efficacy in the next five, ten years, I believe it can. Thank you.